As an economic depression spread across the globe in the 1930s and old hatreds flared into wars, Orwell had much to observe and write about. It was a terrible time in world history. Years later, as he worked on 1984 in the isolation of the island farmhouse, he reflected on the two decades of world war, genocide and torture that had just passed. Orwell projected these terrifying trends into the future. What if, he thought, what if? What if a tyrant were to take the idea of a minute of silence, common on national memorial days, and turn it on its head. The two minutes hate exercise lured even the reluctant into its hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness. A desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces in with a sledgehammer. You see, this is a naughty piece of Orwell's black humor, it's sardonic humor, instead of the two minutes remembrance for the dead, you have the two minutes willing the other side to be dead. <laughs> Orwell had lived through an era when Hitler and Stalin often whipped up national hysteria to rid themselves of political enemies. To satirize the tyrants, he had created the ultimate enemy of Big Brother. Goldstein was the target for the rage of Oceania's citizens. Goldstein was a thinly disguised reference to Trotsky, Stalin's political rival, who was eventually assassinated. Each two-minute hate would always end with Big Brother reappearing on the screen, to the relief of everyone in Oceania. The hates were Orwellian satire, aimed at political leaders who dream of total control over the minds of each and every citizen. In the last half a century, mass demonstrations and organized hates have been a regular feature of television news. But television itself has also become an instrument for manipulating hatred. We hated Saddam Hussein and we had some reason to think that we ought to hate him. Then we hated Osama bin Laden. We don't know what he's done really, but we hate him and we, our hate is kept going. We used to hate Gaddafi but we've sort of stopped hating Gaddafi because things in Libya have calmed down a bit. But undoubtedly, over the next year or two, there will be other hate people set up for us. And of course, it's true that we all long to hate. There's a something in us that likes to hate, and Orwell was very, very perceptive about that. 1984 was published at the beginning of the Cold War, a period of intense hatred and fear and the book was quickly taken up as an ideological weapon by the West against the East. The irony is that George Orwell's politics were decidedly left-wing. Later, he argued that he had written the book in outrage, a blast against totalitarianism anywhere, in the West as well as in the Soviet Union. But there is no doubt Orwell held a seething hatred for Stalin. A decade before he began to write 1984, he had experienced the terror of totalitarian power during the civil war in Spain. The Spanish Civil War erupted in 1936. It was a classic confrontation for modern times, the rich against the poor. Fascists against communists, the right versus the left. It was also a puppet show preamble to the main event, which would soon explode, World War II. Orwell quickly obtained journalist credentials and with his bride Eileen headed for Barcelona. He wanted to be more than just a war correspondent. 
he's supposed to have told his publisher when he asked him why he was going, well, someone's got to kill fascists. I mean, he's much more like an early American Republican. You know, if you feel there's injustice, you, um, you unsling your gun from the um, cottage or farmstead door and you go out and join the militia. And he did just that, joining up with a workers' militia called the POUM, the POUM. He knew the Pumistas were fighting the right-wing fascists, but he knew little about the political complexities of the Spanish left. There was vicious infighting between some of the workers' groups and the communist forces, supported by the Russian Communist Party. Orwell was soon caught up in more than one war. And this is, I think, the hardest thing for non-Spaniards to understand, especially in America, we associate the communists with a revolutionary line. And here in Spain, the communists were actually against the revolution. And that's what I think is very confusing for us to understand. But I think in this case, the communists in Spain were following the foreign policy concerns of the Soviet Union and Stalin rather than the concerns of the workers within Spain. Stalin was concerned that a victory for the workers in Spain would alarm Western nations. He wanted total power over where and when workers would revolt against their bosses. Orwell was outraged at the Russians' betrayal. During a skirmish in April 1936, Orwell was wounded, shot through the throat. It would affect his speech for the rest of his life. He was sent to Barcelona to recover. But once there, Orwell was dismayed to find the solidarity of the leftists had splintered into factional fighting. The Stalinists were soon rounding up the militia and arresting their leaders. George Orwell and his wife fled north. It was a close escape. By the spring of 1939, the fascists had won. It was a devastating defeat for the left, and Orwell was convinced that Stalin's divisive campaign of deceit and terror was responsible for the victory of the fascist general Franco. In the autumn of 1940, the Battle of Britain began. Hitler ordered the bombing of civilian population centers. In spite of daily air raids, Orwell took a few months to write a book, a kind of children's fable that reflected on his experience with the communists in Spain. It was his first major breakthrough book. Animal Farm begins with the idealistic farm animals rebelling and driving the human owner out of the place. At first they enjoy their freedom and equality, but gradually they realize that some animals have become more equal than others. All the characters from the Russian Communist Revolution, disguised as various animals, make an appearance. A pig called Napoleon, the most vicious pig of all, is of course Stalin. I think Animal Farm, in Orwell's intention, certainly, is a lament for the revolution betrayed. Animal Farm is very different in tone from 1984. One reason might be that Orwell's wife, Eileen, had a big impact on the writing with her comments and her contributions. It's a much more accessible book than 1984, and it's um, no, nothing like so despairing. The vision of a dark, forbidding world of the future in 1984 may be connected to the tragic turn of events that occurred in Orwell's life. In 1945, just as Animal Farm was about to be published, just as the dark war years were ending and he had adopted a son in anticipation of a brighter future, his wife Eileen died during routine surgery. It was completely unexpected. Less than a year after her death, Orwell made his decision to leave London with his two-year-old son and moved to the island of Jura. He immediately began work on 1984.